Welcome, everybody, to our final session of Relationships, Reciprocity, and Responsibilities. My name is Patrick Spiro, and I'm the librarian of the American Philosophical Society. And I'm really excited to see uh, the conversation that awaits us. Um, but before uh, we get there, I just want to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, so many people uh, who have made the past week just an absolute success uh, on so many different levels. Uh, a success uh, for us as an institution to be able to be a host for the conversations that happened. A success, I think, for so many people who participated uh, and who learned so much, uh, both from the presentations we uh, heard and saw, but also the conversations that followed. So I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your days over the past week uh, to join us virtually. Um, I am streaming to you from Library Hall, and I cannot wait to be able to invite and welcome so many of you uh, to the library to see our collections and to add and join to our intellectual community that, that we foster here. So thank you again for, for joining us. I also want to thank all of the people who made the past week uh, so uh, successful and to, and to run so seamlessly. And I can tell you that watching it, I know it seems seamless, uh, but that only happened because of the incredible amount of work uh, that people put into making that happen. I want to thank Maggie Hoot, uh, who has been instrumental in organizing a, a number of logistics. Uh, Brian Carpenter, the curator of Native American materials uh, and indigenous materials who has not only facilitated so many conversations, but put so much of his own time and thought into uh, coordinating and organizing the panels, the papers, and the presenters. Adriana Link, who many of you have seen virtually as the head of scholarly programs, who again helped organize the conference itself and coordinated all the panels um, in advance of, of our meeting and is gonna host the uh, conversation, conversation to come. And Kyle Roberts, the head of uh, library and museum programming uh, here at the APS Library and Museum, uh, who has been uh, the leader, uh, making sure all of the cats were herded and moving in the right direction. Um, so I want to thank all of them for the incredible work that they put in, and I hope you all will join me virtually in, in thanking them. I also want to thank the captioner. Um, we've had several people uh, email us uh, and thank us for providing that service, also for providing translation services. So I want to thank uh, those folks for helping us make this uh, conference a symposium more accessible um, uh, to, to folks. I also want to thank the program committee uh, who reviewed the over 100 uh, applications and had to make the hard choice of only accepting about 12. Um, I want to thank Scott Stevens, uh, who also serves on the CNR Advisory Board, and Alyssa Mount Pleasant, who is the program director for the Native American Scholars Initiative here at APS and as a professor at SUNY Buffalo. Uh, finally, um, I want to thank all of the folks who have participated in the Native American Scholars Initiative. And that's really what this final session is going to showcase, the range of work uh, of, of people that are doing new cutting edge research and scholarship uh, that's connecting uh, collections, scholarship and communities together. The Native American Scholars Initiative, which is funded by the Andrew, Mellon, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, supports a range of uh, uh, projects. I encourage everybody to check those out on our website. We have an undergraduate research fellowship. We have something called the Digital Knowledge Sharing Fellowship. And then we have uh, long-term and short-term fellowships for research here in the library. So please check out those initiatives. And I hope you all can join us in one way in the future. And speaking of the future, that's exactly what we want to hear about now. Our next panel explores the future directions of Native American and Indigenous scholars and I cannot wait to hear what everybody has to say. Adriana and Brian, can you take it over? Thanks, Pat. I'm gonna wait for, uh, Brian, are you here? Okay, well, while we're waiting on, uh, on Brian, uh, I just wanted to uh, quickly go over um, some Zoom logistics for today. So as with the rest of our events this week, uh, we are using Zoom webinar. And uh, we really want to uh, have this last session be, be a conversation, not only with our, our former uh, and current uh, NACI fellows, uh, but with all of you who have been watching at home. So um, I encourage you to please uh, submit any questions that you have uh, in the Q&A feature uh, on the bottom of your screens. 
uh, and also to continue the conversation on social media. Uh, we were really heartened to hear yesterday that so many of you are, are having conversations with your colleagues uh, at your home institutions. And, and, and please, uh, you know, I, I hope you'll continue this even after the event is over. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and rejoin our wonderful group of uh, fellows so that you can meet them all. Okay. So, um, Brian, did you want to add anything before we get started? Just to uh, reiterate that we're very grateful for everyone's uh, joining us today, all our fellows uh, for taking the time to be with us today and everyone attending. And I think we should just let uh, proceed and uh, let our fellows uh, speak. Here we go. Great. Okay. So uh, in lieu of uh, introducing them, uh, we thought that it would be great for them to introduce ourselves. So I'm going to call on each of our fellows in turn and, and ask them to just um, say a few words about yourself, um, perhaps uh, what you're working on, and maybe uh, some of the takeaways from your time um, during your fellowship at the APS. So um, we'll start with uh, with Ashton. Ashton, can you just uh, introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I just want to extend my thanks to the APS for having me here and creating such an amazing space via Zoom. Um, I feel really honored to be a part of this conversation. My name is Ashton Pamathanik Dunkley. Uh, my people are from the island of Jamaica and the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Nation of New Jersey, of which I'm an enrolled member. Um, I'm calling to you from Minneapolis, Dakota Homelands. Um, I am a second year at the University of Minnesota's uh, American Studies doctoral program, and I'm a part of their Critical Indigenous Studies cohort. Uh, my research, um, I am working on a tribal history of my own community. Um, I'm especially interested in how both Black and Nanticoke Lenape communities navigated anti-Blackness and white supremacy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as well as how those structures impacted Black and Native solidarities. Um, I was a NACI intern in the summer of 2018, and that gave me a really amazing opportunity um, to really hone in and focus on my research um, through the archives and to really um, to learn from Alyssa Mount Pleasant, for example, of really great archival techniques and how to orient myself um, in that space. And so I'm really thankful for that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ashton. And I should say to all of our uh, panelists that you should feel free to ask questions of one another as we're continuing our conversation today. Um, Angela, I see you next. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Um, well, my name is Angela Tapia and my indigenous name is Sonko, which means heart in my mother language, Quechua. Um, I am a Quechua scholar, a scholar, PhD candidate in Latin American studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I right now I am, uh, and I am also a NACI former fellow uh, last academic year. Um, and um, my dissertation focuses uh, not only on Quechua people, but also Aymara people who inhabit the Andean, who inhabit the Andean uh, Altiplano region. Uh, the border between Bolivia and Peru. Um, I decided to research in these two countries in the states only of my, in, on my own country, um, not um, challenging this idea of national border, but also obeying what the people do. Quechua and Aymara uh, women dress in polleras, uh, we call mujeres de pollera in Spanish. And um, there, are, there are no difference in the way that Quechua and Aymara uh, people wear. Um, I translate uh, mujeres de pollera into women of polleras to keep two, pro two profound questions of this term. Uh, first, do these women belong to polleras? Um, second, um, do these women are made of polleras? I argue that polleras are more than clothing. And through the theories of assemblage, um, I call into question the binarism of human objects through the encounter of flesh and fabrics. 
um, polleras are an assemblage, uh, heterogeneous composition in which um, any of the components subordinates the other. Um, the focus is not on what is each element, but what they are doing through their connections. Um, and I'm really grateful that I have the opportunity to be part of APS uh, last year. Uh, it helps me. It, it it helps me to develop more ideas regarding to archive uh, through in my dissertation and expose me to real archive. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much. It's great to see you after uh, not seeing you here due to COVID for, for many, many months. Um, Tiffany. Oh, we will, are you here, Tiffany? All right, we'll let Tiffany recover. Uh, let's go to Ian in the meantime. Chinkololo migu sionagad ko anjo dalanehi chalagikan tawadon talakwajineo slowly unadash nagati ogesli dohi. My name is Ian McAlpin. Um, I'm from Talakwa, Oklahoma. Um, my I was a NACI intern in 2018 with Ashley and Moana, who isn't here right now. But um, it was it was so integral in really putting into perspective archival research for me as I was transitioning from my undergrad into my graduate degree um, in uh, library and information studies. I'm specializing in archives. So it was really important to get the angle of the researcher and how indigenous scholarship can really be involved and ingrained in archival work in general. Um, so I'm wrapping up my last semester at the University of Oklahoma um, and I've been exploring Nachi uh, cultural items and content management systems. I've been exploring Mukutu, uh, as well as decolonizing and indigenizing uh, archival methodologies for information studies and archival studies in general, and the different approaches that um, this kind of global indigenous um, transdisciplinary field has taken to uh, information studies. So, thanks. Awesome. It's great to have you here. Uh, Tiffany, is your, is your internet back with us? Yes, yes. Uh, I apologize. My internet is, is acting up a bit. Sion uh, Nagad, Tiffany Hardbarker, Dawadon. I am coming to you um, from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. So Ian and I are actually from the, the same place and uh, we are both Cherokee. And so I'm here in Tahlequah where the Cherokee Nation um, and the United Ketua Band of Cherokee Indians is, they're both located in this region. Uh, that's our tribal jurisdiction. And then there is a third fed federally recognized uh, Cherokee tribe in uh, North Carolina, headquartered in Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and that it was our ancestral territory before we were um, forcibly removed to Indian territory where we are now in, um, in Tahlequah. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciated so much the opportunity to be at the APS. I was there for the 2019-2020, I think it was, um, uh, postdoc scholar and I have been at Northeastern State University for five years and so I had quite a bit of teaching under my belt of course always still learning and um, my research was very community and participatory based with um, an indigenous kind of standpoint and lens being the center that grounded any study that I did. And so archives were not really something that I had utilized in my past. And I was not necessarily uh, taught in, you know, how to uh, go about uh, utilizing archival materials in my research. And so the year that I was there, not only did I glean a lot of great knowledge on how to incorporate other resources, but had a lot of support 
from not only Brian um, and Paul and, uh, and everyone there as far as being able to discuss my work. And I had, I was surrounded by historians. So again, that's not necessarily an, an area that I had been in before. And so that was fun getting to kind of jump into a, a different uh, setting or discipline, if you will, or even museum studies, as I came from uh, the background of community development and sustainability. And so it was just a very, it was a, a very different way of looking at things. And I very much appreciated that opportunity to see things in, in a different way. So, yeah. or I'm sorry, what do? Great, it's wonderful to see you, Tiffany. Uh, all right, uh, Holly, what's, what are you up to these days? Hi, I'm Holly Mayuhlak, and I'm Holly My name is Holly Mayuhlak, guys, and um, I'm Inupiaq, Alaska Native. My family's from Unalakleet, Alaska, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. So I'm calling in from Albuquerque, which is ancestral Tiwa lands. And some of the things I've been working on, let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, I think this is, does this show up? <laughs> so this is what I've been working on. I'll just take like two minutes. Um, I haven't launched this yet, but I was a former DKS fellow and also Phillips Fund for Native American Research. And last year during my postdoc at University of California, Irvine, I started working on a website featuring oral histories with Alaska Native elders and veterans who consented to have excerpts of their interviews posted online. So this is like the kind of logo I created, <laughs> worldwar2alaska.com. The website isn't live yet, but I'm hoping to launch it by November, so Native American Heritage Month. I really wanted it launched last year, but I had some delays um, just because of the pandemic. But as you'll see, like I have different kind of links here, like this is the link about Alaska veterans, and I have kind of a description here, and then short videos that I edited on a YouTube channel of the elders who I interviewed who were stationed in Alaska during that time. Also the internment camps, so a couple Aleut internment survivors um, who consented to have these videos posted online. And um, I wanted to share this one too. This is my statement of research goals. I'm often curious like what kind of um, draws people to studies and native studies and also oral histories. And so I decided to just make a page where I just state my research goals. My primary goal as a researcher is to empower indigenous Alaskan communities. As a historian, I seek to center the voices of Alaska native elders and veterans. So I just put that there. And then of course I have my slideshow. So that's a teaser. <laughs> um, look forward to that. I'll probably tweet about it once I launch it. Those are some of the World War II ruins. But I've had a really great time. Thank you, APS, for supporting my research. And I really appreciate all of the colleagues in the program, too. Thank you. This is super exciting to see um, you know, what, we, what Brian and I and, and Patrick uh, heard about in sort of its earlier stages. It's exciting to see it now in, in, in website form. So um, I think Brian will continue to share some more information about Holly's work in the, in the chat. Um, Leandra, why don't we uh, turn to you next? Uh, Leandra, we heard you from you earlier in the week, but maybe you can, you can tell us a little bit more about you, yourself and your work. Um. So, Sigoli Swakwik, Leandra Ni Yugats, Otayuni, Niwagi Dalota, Onoyate Aga, Niwaga Hunjoda, Gale Puriban Parawatami, Niwaga Hunjoda, Gale Muskogi Creek, Niwaga Hunjo, Gale um, Seminole, Niwaga Hunjo. Um, so, hi, I'm Leandra. Um, I am from the, I'm a citizen of the United Nation in Wisconsin, and I'm also Prairie Band, Potawatomi, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole of Florida. And um, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm happy to see everyone. And I was a 2019 Summer NACI intern with Will and Jasmine, who aren't here with us today as part of this panel, but I hope they're safe and well wherever they are in the world. And, um, and so earlier this week, I did a presentation on knowledge that can be found in poetry, as well as knowledge that can, as in how it can work with knowledge that can be found in archives as well. And so, but 
Currently, I am a basket weaving apprentice with April Stone from the Battery Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe through the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation's Mentor Artist Fellowship Program. And so I have a basket. So this is a black ash basket that, that I made. It's a market basket. And so, so with the black ash, we hand harvested it, went out to the swamp, cut it down, hauled it back to her place. And so it's just like a very intensive labor process, but we're able to make these beautiful functional baskets for communities and everything. So it's been a lot of fun. And then also right now I'm trying out like pine weaving or pine needle weaving. And so this is, I believe they're red pine needles. And so I'm just trying to weave a little something to put something in it. So, so yeah, so that's what I've been up to. <laughs> This is great. I'm really liking the sort of digital and, and uh, analog show and tell that we've got going on here. It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, Morgan, um, can you tell us about yourself and, and, and your work? Yeah, um, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. And it's been a really um, sort of wonderful, inspiring couple of days. Um, my name is Morgan. I uh, am Black and Nanakote Lang Lenape from Philadelphia by way of our ancestral lands in New Jersey and Delaware, um, specifically Palmyra in New Jersey and Cheswold in Delaware. I was a 2018 Macy pre-doc fellow, um, so I came in alongside uh, Tiffany, so it's really exciting for us all to be together again, uh, virtually. Um, and I was working on my dissertation, which focuses on uh, Philadelphia's Urban Indian Center in the 1970s and 80s and the ways that multi-tribal communities developed and organized in conversation with and in recognition of Lenape territory. Um, and this is part of a larger uh, critique of multiculturalism uh, where I argue throughout the dissertation that it's um, sort of an arm and technology of settler colonialism, white supremacy and anti-blackness um, in particular. And so I tie these things together through um, performance, poetry, and like various artistic practices that a lot of indigenous folks engaged in often whom are women or femme um, in that sort of category as a way to, to explore the kind of emerging sort of fields of indigenous futurisms and the ways in which indigenous people sort of deny or refuse um, the kind of status of nothing that the sort of settler state uh, assumes or demands of us. I guess that's, I'm just writing now. It's, it's, it's dissertating. So I'm just writing and writing and writing some more. <laughs> great, thanks. It's great to see you. Um, and then last but not least is our newest uh, Macy Predoc fellow, uh, Candy. if you want to just introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. And also thank you to everybody organizing this. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in Latin American Latina Latino Studies at UC Santa Cruz, which is located in UB Aguas and Mutsun Territory. I'm currently in Philadelphia, which is Lenape Territory. And I didn't grow up in a Zapotec community, but my roots are Zapotec. Uh, also growing up, I lived with multiple migrant Zapotec family members who came in and out of my home. And uh, I, my current research is about emotional pains as it relates to social changes that Zapotec communities and Nixtec communities confront the last centuries. It's also about emotional healing and indigenous knowledge. And my field research involves interviews, participant observation of healing rituals. And right now I'm looking at the archives, I'm looking at the Paul Radin papers, Morris Ladesh documents, at the APS related to the Zapotec languages and the way that um, these documents understand or have um, talked about um, how communities talk about emotional pain, such as susto, which means fright, and also sadness. Thank you. Thanks, Candy. We're so excited to have you here in, in, in Philadelphia, and I'm looking forward to, to learning about your work uh, more throughout the year. Um, okay, so you know, I, I really want us to have a conversation. So, so uh, I'll just throw out um, sort of a general prompt, but you all should feel free to, to jump in. So, um, you know, this is kind of the wrap-up session for this event, and you've heard a little bit about what everybody's working on and, and some of the, the papers 
um, throughout the week. So I, I guess I just want to ask, and, and feel free to jump in, um, were there any particular themes or papers or, or topics um, that, that came out this week that really struck you um, or resonated with your work, either from what you've heard in these introductions or, or, or throughout the conversations this week? And um, you know, please just jump in. Um, so, so I'll start. Um, I, so the first panel, which, um, uh, who was he? Eric, Eric Hemin, Hemingway? Or, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that last name incorrectly, but, um, but I really enjoyed what Eric had to say about um, just how we engage with like all these histories that are coming from all different kinds of like sources and communities. And so, I thought that was like a very illuminating and like, yeah, just like a very insightful reminder that there's just all kinds of histories out there in the world. And so we're like always encountering these stories in different kinds of ways. And all of those different encounters just kind of like build our whole like understanding of just like how we see the world because like everyone sees the world differently and everything. And so it was just, I think, really cool how he kind of talked about, like, just there's always this like constant learning going on and happening, which is necessary and which is like a very, like, I don't know, kind of good thing about like humans is that we're just like always learning all the time. And so, so it's just like, it just reminds me that there's like always so much more to do when it comes to understanding each other and when it comes to understanding ourselves as well. Candy's got her virtual hand raised. Uh, I've trained, we've trained you well with Zoom land. Go ahead, Candy. Hello, yes. So I just wanna start off by talking about how Lisa Brooks, the keynote speaker mentioned how there's this need to conduct research at the ground by talking to people. And it resonated with me a lot because um, originally I wanted to analyze this, these notions of emotional healing by just watching films by indigenous Oaxacan filmmakers from the comfort of my home and without meeting, you know, without feeling like I need to talk to people about this because I felt like, oh, I might upset people. And um, Montgomery Hill spoke about how there's this self-consciousness that some researchers have in feeling that they're perhaps not the most adequate person to conduct research because they might lack uh, language skills or practice. Um, and you know that those, those, those things resonated in me. And when I described my research to precisely an indigenous filmmaker, they told me, why don't you go ahead and talk to people about these topics? You know, that's important. And so that changed my project for the best. And at the same time, I acknowledge um, the many bumps that I've stumbled upon while doing this work, which is sensitive. Uh, I, and, I, and I thought about this, um, about how I would approach it. And in Oaxaca, you know, there's a strong need of wanting to help and volunteer. And it might be used through different concepts and frameworks. One of them might be Elagueta, but another one might be Gosona which is something that, you know, Jaime Martinez Luna talks about. And so the first few months I spent time or uh, volunteering, uh, meeting community leaders, buying their books, which I think is really important to do, uh, and also making an offering and um, disclosing my intentions to the, visit, to the sites that I visited, even if it wasn't like necessarily vocal, um, but also could be spiritual. And one of the first things that I noticed is that I have to be careful what I write about because it could be used against the communities that I write about. And, uh, it, and I also have to understand that one of the roles that I have is also to move away from this stigmatizing or victimizing communities, which is something um, Leandra, um, sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name, uh, Skenadori, but I, you mentioned it in, in one of the uh, panels. And at the same time, I wanna talk about the realities that communities face. So I'm still trying to figure out that fine line. And I also see my role in adhering to the ways that I can um, write about sensitive and important knowledge. For instance, in some cases, my interviewees told me, I don't want a photograph taken of me. 
and their, their worst nightmare is for them to appear in newspapers or in social media. So I think it's important to recognize, you know, people don't want, um, you have to respect, you know, they might sh share their knowledge and be happy to share it with them, with, share it with you, but you also have to recognize like there is also like a limit, like, you know, and people don't want to be celebrities necessarily. Um, and I it also reminded me of a recent publication that came out by indigenous Oaxacan scholars that talk precisely about the methodologies they go through and how the fact that the role of gossip is, um, it's, it's, it's really something that's sometimes looked down upon and sometimes researchers are looked at somebody who spread that gossip and the achievement. And um, so, you know, one really has to be careful with that. And also um, in this recent publication, they talked about the role of gender and how being a female a researcher is also, you know, tricky to navigate. And I'd be happy to share that those publications, which are, um, are written by Hilaria Cruz, Emiliana Cruz, who are linguists and they're anthropologists um, in a link. Um, they don't have a, a English translation right now, um, but they're working on it. I've just recently asked them. Um, but yeah, I think I think these are all important points um, that I'm that I'm thinking about. I would go on, but I want to make sure that I'm not talking too much. Well, just going off of Candy's what she's mentioned, I know many of your other projects have involved interviewing people in informal settings, such as making recordings, but also. Uh, of course, many informal settings for background, for context, for the, and uh, just about all of your projects have components of that. Do you have any thoughts and sort of um, how you conducted that in terms of working with uh, and following the uh, desires and objectives of the people from whom you're, uh, with whom you're speaking? Um, I would like to, to say something. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely um, uh, feel the, the fear to, to interview people, um, as Candy mentioned before, um, because uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not only difficult, it, it requires a lot of um, attention and, and, and patience, um, because um, I mean, uh, to an interview, an idea, the interview, I think is a, is a, is a conversation that is fun, that is, you know, engaging. And, and, and it's difficult to, to have this kind of conversation every day with everybody. And, and, you know, we have to, to wait for, for the people who have to say something that we think as scholars, we think is interesting. And we took notes about that. Right. Um, in my case, um, I, I decided to, to dress as, as, as mujeres de pollera, as women of polleras. Um, I, it was the first time that I dressed um, like that. I mean, when I was a child, I, I think I dressed twice or three times just for dancing on the streets. Um, but uh, this time when I do in my, uh, during my field work, I, I dress um, as a mujer de polleras. Um, and of course, uh, I have a, I can I can accept a lot of critiques against that that I have the privilege to dress like that and then come back to USA and and, and perform as a scholar and dress in a Western style. Um, but uh, I think it was very very powerful to dress uh, as as my grandmother uh, wore in the past uh, and. It gave me it gave me a, a, another perspective, um, another. I, I mean, I cannot um, record the conversation that I have with 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 these women. Um, I I never um, interview formally. I think I interviewed maybe twice, but didn't work at all. So most of my my interviews were kind of a conversation, and I trying to to be with them, to be, to be in company with them, uh, trying to help with the, most of the, the women that I work with were um, owner of business. So I, I do some help 
uh, for them, like selling their stuff, you know, cleaning some, some, something in, in their store. Um, and also I, one of them asked me to teach English to her son. So I, I went to her store, I think twice per, per week to teach English and then talk to, talk to her, uh, like many, many stuff. And maybe just one or two ideas uh, were are in my dissertation. Um, so it was more like a develop or a development of a building a relationship, a strong relationship um, with them in terms of um, have you know also disclose that I am a student that I that I came from USA, even though my, I was born in the region. Um, so it was, it was kind of difficult to navigate these kind of boundaries, like as a scholar, also as an indigenous woman. Um, and, but I think it was, it was worth it. And, and I can, and I can, um, it gave me also an opportunity to, to reflect on, on my privilege as a, as a woman um, who has this access to travel, to you know, to to write about it, um, and yeah. <laughs> I can jump in too. Thank you, for, thank you, Angela, for sharing those stories about kind of field work. Um, so over the years, since like the year two thousand eight, I've been interviewing Alaska Native elders. My project started out interviewing elders about segregation in Alaska that predated the nineteen forty five Alaska Equal Rights Act kind of like uncovering what the stories of segregation in Alaska were like, segregating a native population in Alaskan towns, restaurants, kind of public spaces. And then as a graduate student, I shifted my project to kind of like World War II broadly. And these stories of native internment, like camps that some native people were put in in Southeast Alaska, native veterans who were then in the service in the Aleutian Islands where natives had been relocated from, right? So some really complex histories in Alaska. And over the years, I've interviewed over 75 elders. And I think a key component, like Angela is saying, is um, building that strong relationship, right? With some of these elders, I've only had the opportunity to meet them once, unfortunately, because of a situation of like traveling to some place and only getting to meet them once. But other elders I've met with like half a dozen times. So consent is absolutely important, like having an informed consent form doing what they feel comfortable with, whether that's audio recording, video recording, whether they don't want their photograph taken or they just want to remain anonymous or have handwritten notes. So really I've been flexible with whatever people feel comfortable with. And then I kind of developed my own policy within 30 days of transcribing the interview, um, asking the elder at the end of the interview, uh, would it be okay if I reach out to you or contact you if I have further questions? And usually they say yes. And I find that if I transcribe the interview within 30 days, I can then call them and say, hey, you said you were born along this river. Do you know how to spell that river? Because <laughs> sometimes those aren't even on the map. And so it also helps transcribing it yourself and then following up with them because they tend to remember you within a month if you reach out to them. And then I also mail a copy of the transcription back to the elder and I ask if I can leave a copy with the tribal archive. So my kind of consent forms have evolved over the years, but my most recent consent form since I've received funding from APS is if the interviewee feels comfortable leaving a copy at the APS library, along with any tribal archive that they're affiliated with. So I think consent is important, but I also think kind of borrowing from Linda Smith's like decolonizing methodologies, like making sure that our research, research isn't extractive, but that it's giving back in different capacities. And sometimes the giving back can even just be giving back that transcription, right? Because um, family members appreciate that, you know, sometimes you can ask questions from someone about World War II era that maybe their own children couldn't ask about, but a community member who's outside of their family could ask them about that time period. So those are just some of the thoughts I wanted to share. Thank you for the question. Anybody else wanna jump in on this question? All right, well, I wanna to move to, a, we have a question from one of our audience members. Um, 
it's directed to Morgan, but I, I think it's actually an interesting one for all of you to consider. And, and that's, is there a particular source um, that you have found helpful uh, for answering your, your research questions? Or is there a body of work um, that has, has prompted your, your, your research or your approach to your work? Um, I don't know if you can sort of think about this in the context of, of, of broader scholarship and some of the other themes that we've touched on already. Uh, yeah, thank you for the the question. Um, I think I'll, I'll sort of answer the the second one first. Um, I think for me, because the the dissertation sort of I I write like I've written poems and short stories and I've done sort of dance performance art pieces that are part of the dissertation itself, um, and that comes from just existing in space. Um, so a lot of the work uh, has come out of me walking around the city, going to the center, which is now the first Christian Church of the Christian Scientist reading room. But it's it's maybe a block and a half away from maybe two blocks from APS, um, sort of near the ironic, maybe not so ironically, uh, the Museum of the American Revolution. But that's another conversation we can have. Um, but it's it's you know it's like going to the going to the going to the river and sort of sitting with the space um, as a way of understanding where I am and, and, and allowing that be the, the, the conduit through which I understand people and how they were and where they came from. And, and so much of, of life in Philadelphia, both as Lenape territory and as a multi-tribal gathering space is about momentum and movement. And so you have to move, I think, right? To, to sort of do that work, it has to be an embodied practice. Um, I think in that sense, I, I'm speaking through a range of people, right? There's sort of, on one hand, there's a lot of um, sort of Black feminist thought that I think is really powerful and moving that, that sort of pushes us to understand how bodies can exist in spaces when they're said not to exist. Like how, what is, what is our understanding of, of, of reproduction that's not physical? What are ways in which communities develop and, and and, and art and, and poetry as, as these conduits for life in ways that are, that are really important. Um, it's speaking to sort of folks who are doing work in indigenous sort of diasporas. I'm thinking of Jenny Davis in particular, who's talking about um, language, right? And the ways in which the sort of linguistic diversity and, and sort of folks who are in moving to different places or away from their homelands, that language becomes a site for us to navigate and negotiate those, those, those realities. Um, there is sort of a, a broader, I mean, it, it is an urban history, so it is in conversation with folks who are writing about Chicago and LA and Seattle. Um, but I think Philadelphia as a sort of profoundly performative space, um, I, I'm talking to artists. Um, and, and I think they, both the artists in the archive that I'm, that I'm talking to and artists who have been producing work in particular in this time period, the 60s, 70s and 80s. Ian, as, as the linguist on this call, I, I mean, Morgan's response, I, do you have any sort of reactions or, or, or thoughts on, on, on what he's just said? Oh, for sure. Um, my brain is just like swimming and everything and understanding these studies are like uh, approaching research in these, in a spatial way, in a like physically spatial way, especially resonated with me. Um, and like understanding that diaspora is really important uh, as well as uh, descended from people that were forcibly relocated. Um, like I, so um, I, I will say that I've had some background in uh, linguistics, but it's really just to give me a basis for language revitalization. So that's where I take that next step um, for both Nachi and Cherokee for um, how it can change the way you th not only think about things, but the way that you position yourself in relationship, right? Like that's, um, uh, I seem to be losing my words, but um, that's basically what I was, what I kind of resonated with. So I appreciate that, Morgan. No worries. Anyone else want to jump in? 
Ashton, I saw a lot of uh, vigorous nodding coming from your little Zoom square. Yes, there was. There was a lot of vigorous nodding. Um, it was mostly just me in my head saying yes, like, but yes, that's so important. Um, I really appreciated all of the um, everything you said, Morgan. <laughs> um, my work is also on the uh, Nancy Cook Lenape people. Um, and I'm more, so, I'm more so thinking about Delaware and New Jersey, but Philadelphia is definitely an aspect. And I think that's something that um, when thinking about Nanticoke and Lenape peoples, I have to keep to the foref uh, forefront of my mind is um, how connected and mobile our communities are. Um, intermarriages between communities in different parts of Delaware and New Jersey, um, traveling around in like, the solidarities that built between them. Um, so I, I'm currently in Minneapolis, um, and I was also thinking as you were, as you were talking about space, about how much I miss home, <laughs> um, and being back in Delaware because of COVID. It's been almost a year now, um, and that's something that I feel like I am very much lacking as I'm doing my research um, and reading through. Um, as I've been researching and reading through the summer, I keep thinking about how much I want to go home and be on the land um, and sit with my ancestors and to really think um, and to connect uh, because a lot of a lot of what I'm reading is missing that spatial aspect um, and understanding the waterways and the land um, that we're used to like travel and connect Nanticoke and Lenape communities in that area. So yeah, I thank you for um, all of your insights. Can I say one quick thing? Because I think what's that's like that's I think what both of you are, are talking about that's making me think is that there's also kind of this really beautiful set of 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 scholars and in indigenous feminisms who I think are talking about space and like their communities. And it's been really as I'm in Illinois and very, very far away from home, very far away from our waterways that become that much more important the longer I'm away from them, if, if that sort of makes sense. But I've, I've found solace in a lot of that work um, to sort of remind me, Mishana Gomez like is immediately coming to mind, but there's, there's so many other people who are really writing about um, indigenous feminisms and space and sort of understanding mobility that, is, that has been really formative as a person, but also as a, as a scholar and sort of understanding that, that sort of meshing space and how you can be homesick in your work and how do you manage that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I also wanted to give any of you an opportunity, again, and this is not pressure, but if you have any, just hearing about each other's projects, I know some of you know each other, some of you are new to each other's work. If you had any questions or seeing any interconnections across the, your, uh, the work that you're all doing, um, or just things that you were curious and about someone else's work here. Um, I kind of have a question for everyone as indigenous researchers. Um, how, how have you had to deconstruct uh, notions, whether they be or mostly like Western settler colonial notions um, that might be affecting um, your particular communities? Um, when, when I'm thinking about framing this question, I, I think about my home community and the um, how sometimes they're the, like settler colonialism is so powerful, right? Uh, Manifest Destiny was so influential in um, destructive ways, um, but how do you all approach um, kind of community efforts that transcend those like what efforts have you made to um, I guess unlearn as a practice of approaching indigenous communities so like um, homophobia and transphobia is something that I've had to deal with in my own community so just as a specific example um, you can read into that question as much as you like but what are ways that you've had to like deconstruct notions of western settler colonialism in your work
Leandro, we haven't heard from you in a little while. Do you have any, uh, any thoughts on, on Ian's question? Yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts about what everyone said so far. So, so I'm going to try to like keep it as focused as possible. But if I veer off, just bear with me. Um, but so to specifically address what Ian was saying, and like how we kind of like, try to dismantle the just pervasiveness of like what settler colonialism has done to like our bodies as Morgan, like has this or as Morgan reminds us and just like how it's done to like our minds as well when Ian is talking about like how you approach that through like your written work and everything and or whatever form your scholarship takes and so I think right now for me what immediately popped into my head was because I'm doing a lot of basket weaving I'm doing a lot of work with my hands specifically and just the act of like I'm really taken with what Morgan talked about with the whole embodiment. And so the fact that April and I go out into the swamp or to a place where the earth is wet to find a black ash tree and how we have to like just, and she's used to like doing all this cause she's been doing it for like over 20 years. But for me, um, this is my first time kind of going back into like really experiencing the land and everything because like, to be honest, I didn't really think too much about land or nature because I'm from the Oneida Reservation and Green Bay is the surrounding area, which is a very industrial place. And so it didn't, I didn't grow up with that, like, kind of close connection to it or even like understanding what, like, just how that land based relationship and land based living works. And so, but with the basket weaving I do with April, um, really working with my hands again has just kind of helped to combat those like settler colonial invasions because you do get to go out and touch the tree and then you have to like cut down the tree and there's like that whole process and like asking for forgiveness and like telling the tree what you're going to use its body for because it is, you do have to kill it and that's like a very, that's a it's a big deal. And so, and then like bringing the tree back to um, pound off the tree rings and just like that whole, like just activity of using your whole body and like using your hands and like there's, there can be talking and like singing and like storytelling and like crying that goes along with that. But the first time that I had to do that, I was kind of mostly like quiet. because so I was just like, this is like totally new this is like very new to me so I had to watch and listen a lot and but really just kind of like working with the tree touching the tree and everything and really feeling like what that those strips feel like and just like knowing how the climate has been responding from like climate change and all of the corporate devastation that's happening to the land and like feeling that in that tree ring and just like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to articulate it as best as I can, but, um, but that just really kind of like helped to um, like break down that settler colonial bar barrier for me in particular, because you get to just, yeah, you just, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how I'm trying to say it, but like, going off what Morgan said with like that whole embodiment, you're becoming like just back in your body of like doing these, like, yeah, you're just going back into your body and like using your senses to understand what's going on, at least like for the tree and for the climate and what's happening to the weather as well. Yeah. I would also uh, like to play on this the idea of embodiment that has already been brought up and this idea of kind of land-based uh, literacies or learning from the land and in ways that you can't really do otherwise and every indigenous scholar being uh, they come from their own viewpoint whether they were raised in their traditional territories or they either were or were not allowed uh, we're taught traditional ways or language. There's uh, such a spectrum of backgrounds and knowledges and um, 
cultural knowledge and awareness of a lot of these things and relationships that they have access to that I am very honored that I was able to secure a position in my home community, especially because my focus is indigenous led community development. And it means so much to me personally to be able to do meaningful work that the hope is obviously that um, it will benefit uh, my people and um, those relationships are what are crucial and we're speaking of relationships to land and water and what what was just said um it was beautiful about working with the tree and there are certain cultural protocols that you do whenever you gather and you harvest and um the language is definitely the best way to go about doing that but like i said i am not a, a cherokee speaker i uh, know some and I obviously try as much as I can um, as most do but it is a very complex language and we are unfortunately losing at a very rapid rate our elders that are fluent speakers and knowledge holders and so the time is now for um, the indigenous scholars that are seeking to go about doing research in a good way. Uh, earlier, there was a comment made about how um, consent is obtained and how data is used and how it could potentially be used against a community. And so there has to be so much trust there with those that you work with. And I was um, very happy to work with a translator at the uh, Cherokee Nation for my project there at the APS, which was actually 2018, 2019, how time flies. Um, and he, we are kind of, uh, you know, extended family. And so we already had a rapport and I had already built connections with the local high school, which is 75% of their students are Cherokee. And so uh, I had the opportunity to have some great discussions with Cherokee young people and asking them their viewpoints on what um, what uh, life ways for lack of a, just kind of an English term for that. It's just basically everything that makes us who we are, everything that makes us a distinct people from others. What what are those things that just absolutely are so core to being Cherokee that they must be perpetuated? And I like the word perpetuated much more than I do preserved, as it kind of preserved always is a connotation of like a, something stuck in glass, which is not what a living culture is. And so um, the relationships you have to treat with a lot of respect and it takes time and so sometimes those that are seeking to do research in a good way may not have as many published papers and that could interrupt their potential uh, tenure progress or even um, if they are continued to be employed by that university so the thing that I find heartening is that there are so many more indigenous graduate students that are utilizing the academy as a platform but doing so in a way where they are very community engaged so it's kind of in some way pushing back against the higher education western education model while at the same time still having those close and deep relationships to their families and their communities with the intent of bringing whatever knowledge they glean or whatever uh, their work is meant to do bringing it back to the community to uh, for for kind of improved uh, well-being and so I this spring when COVID really hit um, we were all kind of locked away myself and as it turns out many of my students um, we let our yards just kind of gr grow up just let it get big whatever was out there and then I just would go and sit um, 
and see the the beautiful plants that would emerge and many of those would be seen as weeds uh, that tons of chemical sprays are sold every year to kill things like dandelion and chickweed and violet and plantain and all of these other things that are actually very good for our bodies and are not weeds and um, mullein and there are a lot of different uh, plants and foods that I'm starting to connect more with in a more embodied way. And so food sovereignty and, and well-being holistically, as far as our body and our mind and our spirit, to stay balanced while being uh, in a Western institution and while being in this current political um, time can feel very unsettling uh, upsetting and unsafe for for many and I um, I just so I just wanted to kind of play off of what has already been said about a relationship and uh, consent and how when you do embodied practice work with your community that you have to it takes more time. It perhaps it's not just like a, a survey you hand out and then you move on to the next community. That's not the type of researcher most indigenous researchers uh, strive to be. And it just because you're even a famous indigenous researcher like Linda T. Smith, who was just let go at her university, and she is the wide, most widely cited indigenous researcher, and basically kind of. Uh, um, wrote the book on decolonizing methodologies and because she was calling out some racism within the university and within her own department, this tenured professor was let go. And so it's still not a safe space, uh, even if you have received all the accolades. And so many people around Indian country and around the world are, get, are rallying behind her and there, are, I, I, I feel just in the short time that I've um, been in academia, it feels like there are more and more young people that are starting to get their graduate degrees in order to push back. Thank you for that answer. Um, I, uh, it really ties together a lot of what other people have, have um, I've said, um, so I really appreciate that. I wanted to see if we could um, uh, put together one final question to sort of a, a rapid, uh, quick answers. Uh, you don't have to be too quick though for everyone, um, but it's also kind of trying to think of something that, um, that Lisa Brooks said in her, in the opening keynote too, how she saw the kind of the, one of the roles that scholarship in indigenous studies is to kind of create things that can envision new possibilities that will then invite new scholars into the field. And you, all of you are new scholars in the field who have been in it for several years and gone through uh, different stages in the last several years. So I would um, think well, if you have any thoughts on um, opportunities you see for future work in the field and like uh, how you see your work as inviting future people into it as well, and any advice you would have for others uh, wanting to pursue work in, in these fields. And uh, Candy, if you'd like to uh, go first, if you feel like it. Yes, thank you for that question. And I think I would be really excited, and this is also in uh, reflecting what Morgan and Ashton mentioned about thinking about indigenous feminisms and space across diaspora considering North America and Latin America. I think that there's so much scholarship on generational historical trauma from North American scholars, but I also feel like there's a lot of scholars, you know, feministas comunitarias, um, which is uh, communitarian feminists that also talk about these themes. Um, they might not necessarily use the word trauma, but they are speaking about these topics. And so to me, to bridge or think about, you know, for me to think about that there might be these scholars having these conversations with each other in the same spaces is something that I, I think is exciting. And I haven't seen it so far. Maybe there is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I think I would like to see more of that happen. 
and um, in terms of, uh, and also for these fields to inform the field of intercultural psychology. I know Joseph Gahn is one scholar that does that, you know, he really focuses on that. Um, but I'm also thinking of incorporating like these, these scholars that I just mentioned from Latin America. And I think in terms of like advice, um, I think that it, it's so helpful to reach out scholars in indigenous studies with questions. So I feel I would be happy to share my contact information with anybody that would like it. And to also find out organizations or community leaders that do the work that we write about. Because sometimes I feel like, oh, we think, oh, we're the first ones that's coming up with what we're thinking about, but it's it's not the case. So um, it's just so important to figure out, out what that is and to also um, do research on decolonizing methodologies and doing reading about that um, is, was also really useful for me. So yeah, that's, that's, those are a few things that I'm thinking. I can jump in briefly. So this will answer your question, Brian, and it might link to Ian's question a little bit earlier. Um, what I've been observing is there's still a lot of anti-indigeneity, like printed, like within journals and within academic spaces. And it's pretty alarming that Native studies and Native history is still such a, um, it's, it's still very much um, a subaltern field, right? Like, like we're basically trying to advocate for methodologies like using oral history as a method and there's publications that came out within this past year and within this past week with Jeff Finn Paul and also David Silverman's article in AHR. So as a Native scholar and a Native historian, um, one of the things I would like to say is it's really important for allies to also speak out when they see these forms of anti-indigeneity that are printed and that are kind of discussed on social media and other things, and also anti-Blackness. So I think right now it's a really important time, especially when the president is basically trying to cancel critical race theory. Um, we need to have these conversations and we need to keep our research moving forward, but we also need our allies to help support our research. So with that being said, I'd say join NISA, read their journal, <laughs> try to get involved with Native communities with your research, and um, even ask Native scholars for feedback on your work. Well, I think unfortunately we're, we're slowly running out of time. So um, I think that that's a really powerful note to end on. Um, thank you all for, for your words. Um, you know, I, one of the things I love most about my job at the APS is having the opportunity to work and learn from all of you. And um, I've learned so much uh, from the, con the conversations that we've had both during your time at the APS and, and since. So, um, so thank you to all of you again for, for, for your brilliance. And, you know, I'm so excited to see the work that you continue to produce um, in the years to come. Um, just to, to thank everyone again who's been tuning in, we've had uh, over uh, 2,500 people uh, watch this conference over the course of the week, which is, which is astonishing and I think really is a testament to how important um, these conversations are. So um, with that, um, I don't know, Brian, if you have any last things, uh, if you want to just plug CMAR one more time before we wrap it up and um, we'll call it a conference. I just want to once more express my gratitude for everyone who's participated in this and their generosity and their time, and for everyone also for joining in the conversation and attending. And um, we very much look forward to being in touch with anyone, if any way that APS or CNER or our programs can be useful to your work. Um, uh, you don't need permission to get in touch. We welcome your constituency and uh, you don't need any credentials, anything to be in touch, just be in touch and we're glad to um, learn how we can be useful to your work, where, whatever field uh, uh, you're in, uh, wherever you're coming from and whatever your goals are. And um, I want to um, encourage people to uh, stay tuned for when we are able to post uh, these recordings online again uh, later, those uh, that we were able to do so for, and um, to please be in touch. Um, and I'm repeating myself because I'm just, so glad for <laughs> everything and for everybody. And I hope we can all see each other in person again soon and when that's possible, whether it's here in Lenape Hoking, in Philadelphia, elsewhere, uh, however our paths might cross again. Great. Be well, everyone. See you soon.